My grandpa has been going through a lot lately. After grandma died, he kind of went a little mushy. See, we were asked to come and get him one night after he was found wandering near his house. And the police suggested that we might, we might want to have someone keep an eye on him. So I was just sitting around the house, doing nothing with my life. My parents extended the idea that this might give me a little freedom since I had recently been chafing under my father's rules. They gave me rules, of course, like no using my grandfather's house for wild parties, no sneaking girls in at all hours of the night, and my grandfather's safety would always come first. If we get another call about him wandering off, he'll be off to a nursing home, and you'll be moving back home. So I moved my things in with my grandpa, and we became roommates. Grandpa was a pretty good roommate, all things considered. I lived upstairs in the loft. Grandpa had a loft-style house with a whole other dwelling upstairs, and he lived downstairs since it was hard for him to get up and down the stairs. I did most of my cooking and the cleaning, and Grandpa bought the groceries and the beer, though that was our little secret, and we lived in harmony most days. The only thing that annoyed me was all the stories. I mean, don't get me wrong, Grandpa had a lot of good stories. He had been in the Gulf War, he had driven trucks in Alaska on treacherous roads, and he'd spent almost all of his life in the Appalachian Mountains. In fact, this house had been his childhood home. He had many stories about camping, exploring, roaming the woods about the property. Those I didn't mind so much. There were many nights that Grandpa and I would sit on the porch with a case of beer, and he'd tell me stories of exploring the woods and discovering its majesty. It was the lies that he would tell sometimes. He made some pretty good outlandish claims about the woods that I just... I just couldn't shake off. He claimed to have met a Sasquatch, running for his life as it chased him from its part of the woods. He had seen forest spirits and spent a month in the camp as time moved differently there. He had met animal people, spoken with pale, moonlight guards that lived underground, many other things. It wasn't just drunken tales either, those, those I could have forgotten, but he'd ambush you sometimes with these strange little stories. You'd be washing dishes or cleaning the living room or brushing your teeth, and suddenly he'd be right behind you with some tall tale. I almost rolled my eyes at these stories, but last night... Last night he told me something truly ridiculous. My best friend, Ren, turned into a tree. I had choked a little of my beer and finally set it down. I was a little drunk and maybe shouldn't have been so frustrated, but these stories were becoming a bit much. I had heard all manner of stories from Grandpa and just sort of shrugged them off or politely listened to them, but this one was so bizarre that it took me by surprise. His friend had, had turned into a tree. What the hell did he mean? Your friend turned into a tree? I challenged. Grandpa nodded and took another swig of beer. How, Grandpa? Tell me how a person turns into a tree. He looked thoughtful. It's kind of a long story. You sure you have time for it? He finished his beer and threw the bottle into the woods, hearing it break against a nearby tree. I was off the next day, so I nodded. Yeah, I'd say I have time for it. He finished his beer and threw the bottle into the woods, hearing it break against a nearby tree. This was a habit he had kept from childhood. No one seemed to be able to break him of it. Funny thing was that despite him smashing the bottles, I never found any glass in the woods around his house. I always assumed that Grandma had cleaned it up, but I continued to find no glass when Grandma was gone. Just one of life's little mysteries, I told myself. And so, Grandpa began his odd tale. When I was about nine, a new boy moved into the valley. His name was Renard. We always just called him Ren. His family was from the bayou, Louisiana. He was unsure of how th things were in the Appalachians. Still, I was glad for a new playmate since our closest neighbor was five miles in either direction. We played in the hills and forests around our home. Ren liked to find bugs and small spiders, put them in jars so he could study them. Ren fancied himself something of a scientist. The Appalachian forests offered him much more to explore. Now the woods were always open to me, Mama never told us we couldn't explore, but Grandma had warned me never to go into the Southern Grove without her. It was beautiful there. 
The forest's old and different somehow from the rest of the sprawling valley. I asked her why I couldn't explore here alone. She said that it was dangerous if you didn't know what to touch and what to leave well enough alone. Like this, she had said, pointing at a thick, almost honey-like sap that oozed from a nearby tree. That sap of the old Kalabash tree. You never touch it. If you do, not even I can help you. I asked her why. She said her grandma had told her, and hers had told it to her. It's one of those rules that we follow. One of those rules that we don't question. Ren was inquisitive. He wanted to explore everything. He noticed that we were avoiding that particular stretch of forest. Told him stories about the place when we'd first met. That there were two-headed beetles that lived there. About the strange flowers and technicolor patterns. The large trees that my grandmother had always called calabashes. He asked me to take him there, not really feeling comfortable exploring the woods alone yet. He's never far from my side when we are in the woods. He asked me specifically one afternoon if we can go out there. Now, we were young, ten at the most. I didn't take much convincing. I, I had tried to remain steadfast, not wanting anything to happen, since I never went out there without Grandma. He finally broke me down, asked me to take him, and I said that he had to do what I said. Don't touch nothing, I told him, especially if I say so. He promised he wouldn't. We'd set off for the grove. We stopped at his house before setting out. He came back with a backpack that clinked a little as he walked. I had little doubt that it was full of specimen jars and other such things. He may not have intended to touch, but he definitely intended to study. So we made our way to the grove. As soon as he saw the oddly colored flowers, he was in love. The grove is a special place, you see. Things there are closer to nature than anywhere else. Grandma always said it was easier to feel the old world in places like the grove. They had a connection to the earth. A connection to magic. The people who spent a lot of time there could sometimes hear the voices of the forest that others had forgotten. When Grandma read Robert Frost, she thought that maybe he had found some sort of grove of his own. We spent an hour just exploring the grove. Ren looked at the beetles, pulling one in a jar. He could study it later, sketching some of the plants as he made notes. I showed him the calabash tree, that massive white gold giant. And I saw the wonder in his eyes that was there every time he found a bug or a leaf that he didn't recognize. He approached it. And I understood his need to touch it. I, I found myself had needed to touch it the first time I had really understood what I was seeing. It's the size of it, you see. Your mind tells you that nothing that big can possibly be real. But once you touch it, you know that it must exist. It wasn't until I saw him take out his knife that I realized his intent. I ran forward, telling him not to, but he seemed mesmerized by the golden bark of the towering tree. He wanted some, that much was obvious, but Grandma had always made it very clear you do not strip bark from the calabash tree. I mean, Ren didn't know. Probably assumed that a tree so large would have plenty of bark. Couldn't have known what lay beneath. As his knife slid easily into the soft bark of the calabash tree, a golden spurt of sap struck him full in the face. He stumbled back. Sap Flowed as his knife quivered in the side of the massive trunk, I saw him clutch his face and scream. I pulled him away from the tree, the roots threatening to trip him, and as his hands came back, I could see that his face was changing. His face was turning brown, his skin thickening, the pigment of his eyes was beginning to film over as though he was blind. What's happening? Ren asked, his voice deepening as his throat stiffened. I didn't know what, but I knew what I had to do. I left his bag on the ground, the jars slammed together angrily, pulled him onto my shoulders. About three miles into the woods, but Ren wasn't very heavy. He was small, even for a ten-year-old, and I pulled him onto my back. I carried him with very little effort. We ran heading for my grandmother's house. 
Grandma would know what to do. She could save him. As I ran, I just knew that if I could get him there, she would save him. I hadn't gone far when he started getting heavier. Like I said, he wasn't very large. But I was only ten, and Ren started getting heavier. The boy was light when we left the grove. We walked as I balanced him on my back, but he became heavier and heavier as we walked. His arms hung uselessly at my sides. Body became like a stone on my back. My legs started to shake as my progress was slowed to a crawl. When I was drawn up short, I... I thought maybe one of his feet had caught on something. I looked back and I almost dropped him. His feet had elongated until it drug out behind me. His toes were becoming long and searching. They were pushing their way down into the ground. And as I pulled, they attempted to root themselves in the dirt. I pulled him along, trying my best to get him to my grandmother's, but eventually I just couldn't take him any further. We were in a clearing, a stream trickling through that I knew would be a heavy little crossing with the winter flow. I left him there. I left him saying that I would get help. Ren called me back, asked me to stay with him. Told him I couldn't do that. If I gave up, he'd be stuck like this. My grandma knew about these sorts of things. She might be able to help him. I made all kinds of excuses, but in the end, I was just scared. This was weird. It was just so odd. My ten-year-old brain didn't know what to do about it. He said, please, he asked me to stay, his voice cracking like a branch in a high wind. And after some hesitation, I sat, said that I would. His arms and his legs, they were stiff, like bark. He cried tears of yellow sap. I wanted to reach out and wipe them away, but I remember what that sap had done to him, and I resisted. His feet were growing, breaking the ground, sliding into the earth as they sought purchase. I asked how he was feeling. He said it was very strange. He said that as he grew, everything seemed to slow down, to lengthen. He was filled with an odd sense of eternity. He said he just felt ancient, brand new. He felt lonely, yet filled with the knowledge that he was never alone. He felt sad for the life he was leaving behind and excited for the life that was beginning process took about 20 minutes from start to finish, and I sat with him as he changed, not wanting him to go through this alone. His skin thickened, taking on a wooden cast as his legs descended into the earth and his chest expanded. Ren groaned as his bones and his body grew. His small arms were thrust upwards as he reached for the sky. His face and body sort of grew into one, becoming his trunk and his eyes. His eyes began to sink into a newly formed trunk. Much too soon, he was a tree. And I was left sitting beside a half-grown sapling with a pair of expensive rings on its trunk. I sat there, mouth agape, as Grandpa finished his story. What happened after that? I mean, surely no one believed that Ren had turned into a tree. Grandpa shook his head. Only one person... My family and his spent the night searching the woods with a search party from town. They thought that something had happened and my brain had made up something to cope with it. They could see I was shaken by whatever had happened, and they still wanted to find Ren and make sure he was okay. I tried to tell them, tried to explain what had happened, but my grandma appeared at that moment, wrapped an arm around me, told them that she would watch me while the town searched, took me to her house for cocoa. Over cocos and cookies, she told me that she'd tried to warn me about the grove. Said it was a tragedy when it happened, but that was the way the world works. He took a last pull from his beer and launched it into the woods. She said that life's cruel sometimes, but that there was an order. Ren had tried to go against the order. He broke the rules, and that cruelty took its revenge. She reminded me that I must never go against that order. Not if I wanted to live amongst nature. I thought about this before shaking my head and telling him that I didn't believe it. People don't just turn into trees, Grandpa. He gave a strange look. And he walked into the house. 
I thought that was the end of the story, but that would be too easy for Grandpa. See, he woke me up the next morning about three hours before I wanted to be up. And he asked if I wanted to meet Wren. It took my fuzzy brain a few minutes to realize what he was talking about before I remembered the story and asked if he meant the tree. Yeah. Would you like to meet him? I sighed. I didn't have anything going on that day, so I agreed. We walked into the woods, Grandpa ambling along and hiking for about an hour in the crisp morning air. For a man in his seventies, Grandpa moved with an odd grace through the familiar woods of his childhood. I suppose he always had, but it was more pronounced now that he was old. The squirrels and birds had just started to get noisy, and I could hear the sounds of the forest as we walked. The wind in the trees, the soft noises of small animals in the brush as they avoided louder sounds of people. The sigh of the leaves as they pushed and pulled towards the inevitable death. Having come here often to see my grandparents, I too had become aware of the sounds of tempers of the Appalachian forest. My cousins and I often found it beautiful and mysterious. But it could also be fickle and temperamental. I mean, just ask my cousin Jeremy, who had twisted his ankle in a hole, only to find that hole was the home of a rattlesnake. If you could ask him, you know, since he died while we were getting help. Grandpa led us to a clearing, a small stream bubbling beside it, fresh snow run. I could see a large golden bark tree growing not far from that river. It's towering, it's probably 15 feet tall, and as I approached, Grandpa shot a hand out and pointed down. I nearly stepped into a small stream of honey-colored sap that was trickling away from the tree and making its way towards the river. Don't want two calabash growing so close together, Grandpa chuckled. He greeted the tree as we approached, came around to its front to touch its trunk. The tree didn't move, it, it didn't speak. But as I came up, I could see a swirl pattern on the front that looked like two huge eyes. The eyes seemed to follow you wherever you moved, though which was a little unsettling. Though unsettling, the tree looked no different from any other, except for the color and the weird sap. It wasn't until the wind picked up through the branches, shaking the leaves and making them dance, that I thought I heard a creaky old voice say, Hello, Harold, in response to my grandpa's greeting. We spent some time there, just talking that day. It seems I have a lot to learn from my grandpa's old stories. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and thank you for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's podcast. And thank you for clicking the thumbs up, the subscribe, the follow, the bell, the whatever uh, helpful thing there is on such a platform. For those of you that live in cooler climates, you'll probably like to have a nice cup of tea. To get a nice cup of tea, my wife sells it. It's at etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. You can get a whole bunch of different teas there, including creepy pasta based teas. And as always, I want to give a very big thank you to everybody who is supporting me on Patreon. If you guys have been supporting me on Patreon, or if you're considering doing so, then know that I just added in a couple of cool things for the loyalty program because I found out that I could. I had no idea that I could do that. So now... <laughs> You guys should be getting some cool things in the mail brought to you by Patreon that are pretty cool. They support the channel as well. Oh, getting to the point though, a huge thank you to patrons such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Brian Ars, Bobby Carmen, Stephanie Butler, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Kraus, William King, Heather McDonald, Reaper 61167, Alex the Sandwich, Darth Miver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Ness 69420, Isoto Hatred with two exclamation points, Nessie, Ronnie Hansen, Bardo Hawk 764, Melancholy Corpse, Ferb, Harley, Billy Morrow, Madam Skull Bunny, Sashi Suzaku, Grizzly Olsen Dut Pro, Caden the Spooky Boy, Zane Nightshade, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Ashwood, Lord of the Weebs, Jay, Miss Alexandra, Mr. Unsettling Spaghetti, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Fried Chicken 12, Freddy Krueger, Pie Nanny, Michael Scarborough, Infernal One, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kira the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester's Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nina Smith, Nico Cayo, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Trey Smiles, and Corey Kenshin. Thank you guys so much, so, so much, so, so, so much for being a part of the Patreon and helping me keep the lights on and helping me 
get exclusive stories and everything that we do on the channel here. Thank you guys so, so much for being a part of it. Thank everybody in the description. And thank you guys who have stayed to this part of the video. It really means so much to me. I hope you all have a very happy Halloween and sweet dreams.